You know, in this day and age, single-mindedness is not always admired as a real virtue. The media frequently criticises single-issue politicians and single-issue pressure groups. People devoted to a cause may be viewed as either bigoted or narrow-minded. We've seen a lot of that at the moment, aren't we? Society tires of advocates who keep bringing up the conversation around to their point. Such radicals are judged as fanatics or avoided as bores. At the same time, it's single-minded people who move history. Marx was consumed with the idea of a classless utopia. Hitler rallied Germany with the vision of a master race. And the Apostle Paul affected history in a positive way when he, in evangelising the West, he determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's a better thing to be single-minded about, isn't it? Recently I've been reading one of Bill Johnson's many books, but it's one that's called God is Good. He's better than you think. Has anybody read it? Oh, go out and buy it. It's one of the best books I've ever read. In one paragraph, Bill mentions Psalm 27. And I thought, well, I haven't spent a lot of time in Psalm 27. So it's just, I read it, and it just blew me away. And I've been reading it every day for the last four or five weeks. And each time I read it, I see something different, which is something amazing about God's Word, isn't it? It doesn't matter how many times you read it, you read the same thing over and over again, and the Holy Spirit will show you something different. So this morning I want to spend a few minutes unpacking this psalm, and as I do, I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit will speak to each of us afresh today about how good God really is, and how we can respond to his love. So let's just do a quick breakdown of it. In verses 1 to 3, David illustrates his absolute trust in God. In verses 4 to 6, it's the supreme value of God's presence. In verses 7 to 10, David's own devotion to obedience. And in verses 11 to 14, the grand finale is the unveiling of his personal secret to strength. Wonderful subjects. He puts it this way in verse 13. I totally trust you to rescue me one more time so that I can see once again how good you are while I'm still alive. That might sound a little bit different to what you're looking at because that's coming from the Passion Translation which is one of the latest translations and I find it very, very helpful to use it. It was his hope of seeing the goodness of God in his day that kept him from hopelessness. Now, hopelessness is a faith. If ever there was a season in all of history that people of God need to believe will see the goodness of God, it's right now. God's people are to be known for their hope, regardless of their circumstances, perhaps more than any other virtue. Olivia Shoup once observed, the one with the most hope will always have the most influence. Isn't that interesting? The one with the most hope will always have the most influence. And we have a good reason for hope. God's goodness wreaks havoc, havoc on despair, depression and hopelessness. Seeing his goodness releases the opportunity for faith. And that's what we want to look at this morning. Expecting to taste and see his goodness keeps us... I've lost it. Improve us to the mental and emotional breakdowns that violate who God designed us to be. Carriers of hope and models of his goodness. It's a big responsibility, isn't it? Psalm 27 is a mountain peak of single-minded confession of trust and faith. Here's the one thing I crave from God, the one thing I seek above all else. 
I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house, finding the sweet loveliness of his face, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. That's part of it we'll look at in a moment. So as we study this psalm, we're infected by the writer's power over his circumstances and the passion in his heart. So the first three verses, David's absolute trust in God. Now, so this will be a little bit different to what you've got, but if you just want to listen to it. The Lord is my revelation light to guide me along the way. He's the source of my salvation to defend me every day. I fear no one. I'll never turn back and run from you, Lord. Surround me and protect me. When evil ones come to destroy me, they will be the ones who turn back. My heart will not be afraid, even if an army rises to attack. I know that you are there for me, so I will not be shaken. Now, if you know a little bit about David's life, you find many times he had armies coming to attack him. He had Saul trying to kill him. His own son Absalom tried to kill him. He was always seemed to be in trouble. Verse 1 opens with a positive confession of faith. As in the, in the preceding Psalms, David's intensely personal faith is reflected in the use of the positive, uh, possessive pronoun, my light, my salvation. Similarly, we read in Psalm 20, 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Personal faith. Biblical, fa biblical faith is relational at its core. God prepares us for the incarnation, the supreme personal event of history, by calling us into communion with himself and building a strong relationship with us as we learn of his steadfast love. In 1 John 1 and 1 we read, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Would you have liked to have seen Jesus in the flesh and be able to say that? I would have. I would have loved to have walked with him physically in those days and seen everything he did every day for three years. Whew. The Lord is defined as David's light and salvation. As light, God is the revealer, and as light, God is also holy. Since the Lord is David's light, in his presence the darkness of his enemies and the darkness of his fears are expelled. However, God is not just the holy revealer, he is salvation. The word here included the idea of deliverance and rescue, and is the same word from which the name of Jesus is derived. The thought of God as Saviour leads David to this rhetorical question, Whom shall I fear? It's a good question, isn't it? Since the Lord will rescue him from his foes, there is no reason to be afraid. And next, David confesses, the Lord is the strength of my life. The word strength may mean refuge, taken from the root word stronghold. God protects him. Again, his confession is followed by the rhetorical question, of whom shall I be afraid? Faith or fear, these are our ultimate options. Either we can know the living God as our light, our salvation and our strength, or we are condemned to anguish as we move through into our final hour of death. The atheist, the atheist philosopher Bernard Russell puts it this way. Now listen to this. The older I get the more nervous I become. Isn't that interesting? The closer he gets to death, the more nervous he becomes. In contrast, two weeks before his death, Pope John said, my bags are packed and I'm ready to go. Wow! 
your bag's packed and you're ready to go? Oh, I know mine are. <laughs> In verses 2 to 3, David now turns to his enemies as God delivers him from them. He is delivered from the source of his fears as well. He remembers when the ones to destroy him, when the ones to destroy me come, they will be the ones who turn back. Enemy troops may march, but if the threat should come, and it often did in David's life, he will be confident in God. His security comes from the Lord. He confessed in verse 1 as his light and his salvation. Beyond the deliverance of the Lord, however, is the Lord himself. And David now turns to verse 4 to his single-minded longing. So let's read the supreme value of God's presence, verses 4 to 6. Listen to this. Here's the one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. David's single-mindedness. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house, finding the sweet loveliness of his face. Filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. I want to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in my every prayer. In his shelter in the day of trouble, that's where you'll find me. For he hides me there in his holiness. He has smuggled me into his secret place where I'm kept safe and secure, out of the reach of all my enemies. Triumphant now, I'll bring him my offerings of praise, singing and shouting with ecstatic joy. Yes, listen and you will hear the, the fanfare of my shouts of praise to the Lord. How's that for one Mind and direction. David describes the passion of his heart in three ways. He wants to live in the Lord's house. He wants to contemplate the Lord's beauty. And he wants to hear from God. The language is emphatic. He pursues his passion with a vigour as he seeks a threefold response to his single-minded quest. To live where God lives, to spend his life in his presence, will allow him, allow him consistent worship, and then to pray without ceasing. How's that for a single-minded focus? This desire is fulfilled in us in Christ who calls us to abide in him and who promises to abide in us. John 15 verse 4. The Hebrew word for abide means to dwell or to remain. When we come to Jesus and receive his spirit, we live before him. We dwell in him, and his presence remains in us for all eternity. That's what Jesus meant when he talked about having abundant life in John chapter 10, verse 10, which he gives to us. Paul says that for life for him is Christ. To dwell in the house of the Lord for us then is not to live in the tabernacle or temple in Jerusalem, it is to open our heart's door to Christ and allow his spirit's presence to fill us unceasingly. As Jesus promises, up in, promises us in John 14 verses 15 to 17, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit will abide with you forever for he dwells with you and will be in you. Isn't that beautiful? The second response that David seeks is finding the sweet loveliness of his face, filled with awe, delighting in his glory and grace. Where can we see such beauty but in the face of Jesus? And when we see his beauty, we see the beauty of the Father. This is the beauty of his gracious love, the delight that is on his face towards us, his smile, his outstretched hand. Remember what Nadia shared with us a couple of weeks ago about God's outstretched hand? <coughs> oh, oh, excuse me. Verses 
excuse me. The point of living with the Lord for David and for us is to contemplate him. But tragically, our churches are filled with people who dwell in his house but fail to contemplate his beauty. It is only in contemplating him that we are changed to be more like him. It is only in contemplating him that praise comes alive, devotion is real, and prayer is precious. I'll just have to have a drink. I'm drying up. (laughs) You know, a couple of weeks ago we sang a beautiful song. Some people call them choruses, but you can call it whatever it was, whatever you like. The song was, Your beauty is so beautiful. Your glory is so beautiful. Remember it? My life is yours. My hope is in you only. My heart you hold, because you make this sinner holy. Holy, holy. Because your glory is so beautiful, I fall unto my knees in awe, and the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your light, because your glory is so beautiful. You know, I reckon David would have. I reckon David would have written that a long time ago. They're just the words that he would write, have written when he's thinking about writing this psalm. And just by the way, most of the psalms were written as hymns. In fact, the early New Testament church never had hymn books or song books like we have them. They just sang psalms. The third response that David seeks is to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in my every prayer. You know, one of the newer experiences of my Christian walk is to wait after I pray. To wait for God to speak to me. If I just chatter at him and then walk away, how can I say that he never seems to speak to me? Had that experience? I'm never listening. That's why he can't speak to me. When I take the time to open in open responsiveness to him, often a clear word will come. Inscribed on my my mind, it may be a prophetic message, it may be a word or a phrase from scripture, it may be an impression or a picture, or even something to prepare a sermon on. God speaks when we wait for him. The trouble is so often we speak and then we rush off to do whatever we've got to do and God has to shout at us in the distance as we're running away and we don't hear him. The sequence in verse 4 is crucial. We We must first live with the Lord and he with us. Next we must contemplate his beauty in worship and praise. And then and only then are we ready to hear from him. When our hearts are open to hear his word rather than the mere echo of our own (coughs) excuse me, prayers. This is going to be a regular occurrence for the next few minutes I think. If anybody coughs more than anything, it might help me. <laughs> you, know, you all clear your throat and cough, and then that'll, that'll help me, I'm sure. <laughs> In verse 5, David sees the consequences of him being before the Lord. In the day of trouble, he hides me in his secret place. God does not block us from trouble by denying. He protects us from the results of trouble. Let me say that again. God does not block us from trouble by denial. He protects us from the results of trouble. The results of the presence of God and the protection of God are first, David will triumph over his enemies. Second, David will bring offerings of praise before the Lord 
a shout of triumph, a victory cry. This is really robust worship. Third, David promises singing and shouting with ecstatic joy. In heaven the saints sing to the Lamb because they have been redeemed by his blood. These songs of victory follow God's liberating, delivering work for us. True worship rings with the joy of those delivered from sin, Satan and death. You know, I spent the first 40 odd years of my life and I've been derogatory in, in, a, in a Christian Brethren church and I don't remember in that whole time hear any joy or static joy, praise. Don't you laugh, Peter. <laughs> it was just absolute silence. And then I went for 25 years in a Baptist church and that wasn't very much better. But then... Three years ago, I came here, and I'm still only a baby Pentecostal, <laughs> and I hear ecstatic joy, and I hear people saying hallelujah, and all things, and my heart just goes, beautiful. That's what it's supposed to be like. Thank you, Jesus. Third thing, David's own devotion to obedience. Verse 7, God, hear my cry, show me your grace. Show me mercy and send the help I need. Lord, when you said to me, seek my face, my inner being responded, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. So don't hide yourself, Lord, when I come to find you. You're the God of my salvation. How can you reject your servant in anger? You have been my only hope, so don't forsake me now when I need you. My father and my mother abandoned me. I'm like an orphan, but you took me in and you made me yours. Wow. David now turns from meditation on the Lord to conversation with the Lord. From this we learn the how-tos of devotion. After we have reflected on the character of God and ex expressed our single-minded desire for him, we need to address him directly. So David prays, God, hear my cry, my cry, show me your grace. In calling God by name as David does, we enter into direct relationship with him. Next, David asks for mercy. Show me mercy and send the help I need. The mercy of God will be given as he answers David's prayer. In verse 8, David enters into the actual prayer di dialogue with God. When you said, seek my face, my inner being responded, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. The call to all to seek the Lord's face is, in the language of the day, a call to seek his favour. As we read in Psalm 34, verses 15 to 16, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. David responds in kind to the divine command or invitation when he says, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. In asking God to turn his face towards him, David entreats the Lord not to respond with rejection. He prays, so don't hide yourself from me. In a parallel clause, he then asked God, he asked the Lord not to be angry. In this request, David is very conscious of his sin. And if you know the whole story of David, he sinned a number of times, very, very severely. Certainly God has the right to judge, judge him. It is only by his mercy that he will continue to look upon David with his favour. And God actually refers to David as a man after my own heart. In asking God not to be angry, David also identifies himself as God's servant. He prays in humility, in submission to God as his master. Next, David reminds God of his past goodness. 
You have been my only help. And then the request for God not to abandon him is repeated. Verse 10 completes the thought of abandonment as David adds, My father and mother abandoned me. I'm like an orphan, but you took me in and made me yours. Does that warm your heart? Oh. The abandonment by family was certain death experience in the ancient tribal Israel. If you were abandoned by your parents, that was it. You'd be, get left for dead. Even in our individually, individualist world, it is still the same ultimate personal loss. Whatever David's actual experience was, way beyond the love and security of his family, is the provision of God himself. As Moses promises Joshua, the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. This is David's bottom line as well. It's not a bad bottom line to have, is it? Fourth, David's unveiling his personal secret to strength. Let me have another mouthful of this. Verse 11. Now teach me about all your ways and tell me what to do. Make it clear for me to understand, for I am surrounded by waiting enemies. Don't let them defeat me, Lord. You can't let me fall into their clutches. They keep accusing me of things I've never done while they plot evil against me. Yet I tro totally trust you to rescue me one more time so that I can see once again how good you are while I'm still alive. Yeah, I've got a lot of favourite verses, but this is my ultimate favourite verse in this psalm. Verse 14. <coughs> Here's what I've learnt through it all. Now here's David, he's been through all these experiences. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Ooh, that hurts. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave, be courageous, and never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting, for the Lord will never disappoint you. Whoa. David turns now to a prayer for God's ways to be known to him. The worship of God leads to doing the work of God. Let me say that again. The worship of God leads to doing the work of God. So David prays, Now teach me all about your ways and tell me what to do, for I am surrounded by waiting enemies. So the theme of opposition returns as David has spoken of enemies and armies in verses 2 and 3. He has mentioned the day of trouble in verse 5 and of him being triumphant over his enemies in verse 6. That's the story of David's life. His prayer for the Lord not to abandon him is also related to God's using his enemies as instrument of judgment. Here then David prays for the ways of, the God, the ways of God his path and direction to be made clear, to be led in the way that means for David to be taught by the Lord and to be guided through the opposition of those enemies who can defeat him. From the positive reverse request of verse 11, David now turns to a negative cry when he says, Don't let them defeat me, Lord. Well, why might God do that? I'm sure some of us have asked that in our own lives. The answer is that these enemies lie about him. They are plotting evil as their intention. But because David seeks the Lord's face and the Lord's will, his heart's desire and action expose the deception in these attacks on him. For God to deliver David to these enemies would be an improper judgment on him. 
to be delivered from them as he asks will be a sign of mercy. David's confidence in God, witnessed to us in verse 13, is based on his faith that he will once again see how good you are while I am still alive. Through the attacks of his enemies, David is held by the hope of God's intervention on his behalf and his ensuing goodness. Leslie Newbigin, a missionary statesman who spent many years in India, suggests that the terminal illness of the West today is the loss of hope. Amen. He finds this clear he sees finds this clearly in Europe among the masses who have given up on the future and are living meaningless lives on the edge of despair. We see it in our local communities and particularly on the streets of our nation's capitals. With the exception of pockets of Christians, he senses an atmosphere of doom in the air. We only want to watch the news of a night to see that, don't we? Now listen, the shocking thing about this is that only a generation or so ago, the West pulsated with the hope, the reason that technology would solve our problems and bring in a new millennium. Today, however, this hope is gone. We, like David, need a renewal of faith so that we may again see God's goodness, his kingdom in our day, in the land of the living. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As we have seen in this psalm, David has a single-mindedness, single-minded desire to gaze on the glorious beauty of the Lord. So in the midst of his trials, he turns to the God who has called him to seek his face. Listen to the closing verse. Just a minute. Right now you can listen to it. I love this. Here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave, courageous, and never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting, for he will never disappoint you. Wow. I love that word entwined. I meant to bring a bit this morning, but in a rush to you, I forgot. If you pull a a length of rope apart, you'll notice that it consists of a number of strands, usually at least three, all entwined together. Have you ever noticed that? In one strand you might be able to break it, but when you get three strands tied, entwined together, very much difficult to break. The strength of the rope is in how many strands of small accord are entwined together. You look at those whopping big ropes that they tie up huge boats to the port in, you know, probably 20 or 30 or 40 strands of rope all entwined together. You know, our daughter Kim, when she married Russ, the marriage celebrant, as part of the celebration, did a God's knot little part of the wedding ceremony. Anybody heard of that before? Well, I don't know. I've done a number of weddings and been to a number of weddings, but I'd never heard of it. It's based on the thought of Ecclesiastes 4.12. The cord of three strands is not easily broken. Remember that? One strand you might be able to break. Now, the concept was that they had three strands hanging off a metal ring, The middle one was gold, which was representing God. There was a purple strand representing the groom, and a white strand representing the bride. Now, I won't go into all the meaning behind it, but if you want to look it up, just look up Google God's Knot, and it'll come up and give you all the things. Anyway, part of the ceremony was that Kim had to take these, it wouldn't be any good for you, I couldn't do it, but had to take these three strands, and she had to plait them together, 
to make one strand. Understand the concept? So as Kim plaited these three cords together, and as she did so, the three cords became one. All entwined together. God, Ross and Kim. That's why I love the word entwined. We are entwined together with God. As a small group, there might be five or six or seven of us, all entwined together. As a church like this, there's a lot more. But we find strength together as we're all entwined together with God. The thesis of this psalm is that the single-mindedness of David's desire to behold the beauty of the Lord, the final clause reveals how this will be a he will achieve his aim by waiting on the Lord. The God who wants us to be with him will take us there. As we wait on him, he will commune, we will commune with him and grow in trust to, with him. David's, David's single-minded goal demands single-minded means. Thus he waits for God to fulfill his promise and usher him into his presence. This is fearless, triumphant faith. And it can be ours. Let's pray. Our loving God, we just want to thank you this morning for your word. We want to thank you that although this psalm was written so many thousands of years ago, it is still just as relevant to us today as what it was then. And so we want to pray that as we think about this psalm, as we think about the message that you have wanted to give to us this morning through the power of your Holy Spirit, we just want to pray that you might guide and lead and direct us. We want to pray that we might wait on you. That we might wait for you to guide us and lead us. We might never rush ahead of you and then make major blues. But that we might pray with you. We might spend time waiting to hear your still small voice speaking to us. And guiding us every step of the way in our life. So Father we just want to pray that you'll bless us now as we leave this place we've been able to spend together with you. We want to pray that as we go to our homes that you'll go with us. Help us to think about these things during the week that we might spend time with you. That we might become more and more entwined with you so that you and us become one. So bless us as we think about these things and bless us throughout this week we pray in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.